Welcome back to the Leading in Athletics podcast. This is Heath Esslinger. If you've been listening to us from the very beginning, we've been on a journey to impact athletic departments, youth sport organizations, and governing bodies by creating alignment between parents and coaches and working to restore the joy of sport for all involved in the athletic journey. We want to transform organizations through our parent and coach playbook. We'd love for you to come alongside to help us reach our ambitious goal. If you'd like to learn more, you can follow us on social media. All you have to do is simply search A Better Way Athletics. You can also visit our website at www.abetterwayathletics.com. Again, that's abetterwayathletics.com. But before we begin today, here's what we want to do. At A Better Way Athletics, we believe it's about people. Those people operate in families, communities, cities, a nation, and this great world that we live in. And we simply want to take a moment right now, whether you're riding your bike, you were out on a jog, you're driving your car down the road, you're walking, or maybe you're just sitting at your desk listening. We want to take a moment and simply reflect and pray and ask, hey, what could we do as individuals to make this world a better place? So pause with us. And for all of you out there, we say thank you. At A Better Way, we want to be a part of the solution, not just a part of the problem. And we definitely just don't want to be those that identify the problem. And we have on our show today a special guest. I met this rock star of a lady, I don't even know how many years ago, time flies when you're having fun, but she was presenting and I was like, I want to get to know her. I want to be in her camp. I have prided myself on surrounding myself with people much smarter than me, and Dr. Stanek is definitely that. She was born and raised in Nova Scotia, Canada, where she attended and played soccer at St. Francis Xavier University. Through the years, she has developed a strong work ethic to accompany her active lifestyle. That active lifestyle included some mile repeats right before we got on this podcast. So not only is she active, she's a little bit crazy. She is a wife to a former wrestler, which probably makes her crazy in it of herself. She's also a mother. She has an undergrad de degree. She has a master's degree and her name is Dr. Amanda Stanick, PhD. She also has her doctorate degree, but most importantly, she's written books, chapters. She's, she's an in influencer in the movement world, whether that be physical education in the schools, in corporations, whatever. She's a well-known speaker, but most importantly, she is an absolutely terrific human. She is an encourager, all at the same time being a challenger. And that's why I appreciate her so much, because she truly is making a difference in this world. Dr. Stanick, thanks for being on our podcast today. Keith, it's always so nice to get to speak with you. And it's very humbling to be an invited guest today. So thanks for having me. Well, thank you for taking the time for being here and for kicking MacGyver out of the house. I call her husband, most people call her husband MacGyver, I guess, because he's just a do it all kind of guy. So Dr. Stanick, we mentioned your past briefly. Tell us a little bit about you, your past, your family, and really the whole move, live, learn movement. Like where'd that start? What's it mean? Sure. Yeah. So as you mentioned, I grew up in Nova Scotia, Canada. So I actually grew up in rural Nova Scotia and I have three older brothers and a younger sister. And uh, kind of a traditional family. My mom was at home with us and my dad was a snap-on tool man and he was on the road long days. And my mom actually had a car accident as a teen. And so she didn't get her license till she was 40, close to 40. Wow. So there was five kids and we lived in this, on a very picturesque childhood on a little lake in rural Nova Scotia with a bunch of kids our age in the neighborhood. And so there was just a lot of time outside playing and, you know, uh, wanting, there's only two years between my brothers and I, each of us. And so, you know, they would sometimes let me play road hockey with them, but I would always uh, get to play, you know, stick ball and, and pick up games and things like that. Um, so my childhood was very uh, perfect in, in that way, mm -hmm. just, um, just a typical 70s kid. <laughs> That's uh, awesome. You were like you were like Little House on the Prairie in Nova Scotia, Canada. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, not quite. You know, we <laughs> but um, we 
if the town that I grew up outside of was about 5,000 people that would double in population because it is home to St. Francis Xavier University, okay. which is a really strong undergraduate school in, in Canada. And so they have an international program there. So people from all over the world would come. And so even we're in this little tiny town in rural Nova Scotia, we would see people from all over the world in their traditional dress. And, you know, we had uh, the, the professors and the physicians hang out with the electricians and the carpenters. It was just like a really beautiful community mm. where everyone has each other's back. Um, in, but there wasn't a lot of work. And so as I graduate in 1994 from university, I took a job to teach and coach at a prep school in Virginia. And that's what first brought me stateside. So I was awesome. at the collegiate school in Richmond for five years, where I then did my master's, as you mentioned, at night in sports psych and phys ed. And um, coached a lot of soccer, coached a little pole vault. That's a whole other funny story. Uh, and then moved home. Or no, then I went to UVA and attained a PhD in kinesiology and then moved back home to that beautiful little town and was a professor there for three years. Wow. But uh, as in between there at UVA, I did, I met Jim. Um, and so the first three years of our marriage, we were in different countries. And so I said, wow. Yeah. So I ended up, he convinced me to come back down after, you know, we had a duel and I lost that duel. Uh, wow. <laughs> so, um, and, and that's kind of when move, live, learn was born. I took a couple of years. We had our first two children and I was home with them and i um, pushing that stroller. I was like, I'm passionate about my work and I missed work. I loved being with the kids. So I wanted the flexibility and Jim was always really supportive. Like, why don't you work for yourself? Cause people were asking me to do these little side contracts mm -hmm. and he's like, you need a website. And I was like, Oh my, I was very Canadian. People will think, I think I'm good if I have my own website and he's very, uh, you know, driven American, you know, like woman, you'll only get paid what you're worth if you work for yourself. <laughs> like, That's hilarious. That website. So it was that move, live, learn was born out of a desire to get phys ed health and education out of their silos and, and sport, sport, health and education and, and bring them to the same table to come with comprehensive solutions. Um, being a Canadian and being a professor in Canada, though, I also had this very strong social justice uh, calling in my blood where I wanted to make sure, for example, children with disabilities weren't thought of as an afterthought, but mm -hmm. as a day one of the conversation. And so what I wanted to do was bring sport education and health to the same table and talk about those who have additional hurdles to jump at the beginning, whether it's students of color, whether it's students with disability, wanted to make sure that they were thought of from, from the onset. And so that was 12 years ago. And, you know, and ever since I've just been hustling through with move live learn um doing research projects for comp or organizations writing curriculum for others professional development mm -hmm. online training coaching education so i'm really just an independent contractor who provides related services related to teaching coaching and and research well i want to say you're not just an independent contractor all right <laughs> you are you are making a tremendous difference and, and again, the, the word I wrote down here, it, and I've never, I've never really been able to articulate it with you because uh, our relationship is distant. Uh, I do think we're very similar, but, you know, I, I feel like you're, a, you're an advocate. You know, you're an ad, advocate for those things that are good uh, in our society. And I think you, you really have a passion to go to bat for uh, the less fortunate and maybe those that would normally get left out. And, and movement is not for the elite athlete. Movement is for the human. Yeah. Uh, Thank you for saying that. You know, it is that a slippery slope because as a business owner, you know, you'll re I'll receive unsolicited advice. You know, you shouldn't be outspoken about certain things because people might not want to work with you. But if I'm true to my values and my values are integrity and my values are kindness, if, if those are my if kindness is one of my core values, like mm -hmm. how can I, how can I not you know, advocate for others, like mm -hmm. use my position. Um, and, and I, you know, didn't grow up a privileged, you know, UVA would have laughed at me when I was in high school. I was a very late bloomer academically, um, you know, first generation, you know, like graduate, 
you know, those kind mm-hmm. of things. So, um, but, but I'm, my brothers are educators and, and accountants, like we've, through sport and, and through the opportunity with wonderful role models, and this is what we, you know, talk about when we get to speak and through great parents, which we also share, um, the world just opened up. I mean, no kid from a fishing village in Northeast Nova Scotia should be presenting research at the Olympic Museum in Mm -hmm. Lausanne. I mean, that's pretty cool, right? Yes. That's from sport, like positive Mm -hmm. sport experiences. So, Mm -hmm. um, and and then, you know, with my own family, I have three daughters, they're four, nine and 11. Uh, So, you know, the days are long and the years are short. (laughs) <laughs> That's right. That is no, no doubt about that. And I love that you talk about that positive sport experience. That's really our purpose at A Better Way Athletics. We want to help parents and coaches create a positive sport experience because we believe no matter where you fall on the talent scale, uh, because some of that's already predetermined for us and that doesn't make you of lesser value. Uh, it just may, may mean your sport, like competitive sport career is shorter, but what you can learn on that journey sets you up for what's next in life. I mean, I have a brother we grew up on a little farm in McDonald, Tennessee. He's a pediatric doctor. I got to be a division one coach, but all of those things we learned catapulted us and provided us the tools to be where we're at today. And so I just appreciate your passion for that. Thank you. And I, um, I'll leave that for later. Cause I know you wanted to ask me about so, that. Later. So let, let's talk, you and I talk often about the sport journey and, ha- and obviously we have similar thoughts. We don't always agree on everything. And guess what? We still love each other. It's a great thing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I want you to discuss the danger because you and I kind of have some unique thoughts on this. You know, there, there's all this stuff about multi-sport. I was actually just on a call with us youth soccer and the, the guy used one of our terms, he called it multi-activity. And so we hear a lot about this multi-sports, the cure for all kids, how you prevent energy, lot, injury, and you prevent burnout. But like, listen, I think our research is a little bit skewed and our thought process is a little bit narrow. Talk to us just about your ideas and, and the, the research that you've done there. Yeah, I haven't done like re- proper research myself. I haven't led studies in this myself, but what I, what I know that we, you and I really agree with is the, first of all, I think multi-sport, this multi-sport push is, uh, it's buzzwords from no doubt the, the very, and, and so come back to that. What I love about Better Way Athletics is I think what you all are doing and will continue to do and what is missing currently and what is so needed is the parenting education piece. And what you're doing with coaches to help them learn how to engage with parents is so key, but then the direct work with parents, like the more I learn about what you're doing in that space, I'm so pumped because there, the, the vast majority of sport, youth sport serving organizations, and I mean, Like, this is like, you know, as a white dude, you're gonna be like, well, thanks. I mean, they're all white guys. They're all, you know, between 40 and 60. They all say this was the best way, but yet how many of them are like sedentary now? You know, so it's like, stop preaching at me. Like, like, let's learn from our educator friends. Let's learn from our our mom friends. Let's learn from the female coaches out there. Mm -hmm. So what I love what you're doing is you are broadening the like what is being provided to youth sport and you're doing it in a way that is going to be so positively impactful because i think parents want to do what's right there's just i remember leaving the hospital with my first child like wait a second where's the exam like what the yeah i know yeah where's the manual yeah like what's going on i had a book like what to expect when you're expecting oh yeah it's actually a good book it is you know but it's like Okay, you know, I just wish I didn't read anything in it by the time I had the third. I mean, you know, so, so I think what I love with, and and my partner, Jim, he, he does a great job with this. Like we do a lot of active things as a family. We mountain bike a ton. I bring the ice public ice skating habit to the, to the crew. We go down whitewater rivers as a family. Like we, um, spend, and if we were to just really yeah, and our kids do multiple sports, but oftentimes when people say multi-sport, if you broke it down, our kids would be so overscheduled that they would yes. have 
A, no time for family, B, no free time. And they would just be little like miniature adults. Kids mm -hmm. are miniature adults. They're kids. And when they say, oh, well, I only draft these people who played blank sports in high school. Well, like, you know, yeah, right. These kids were multi-sports in high school because they're just insanely gifted and talented. Yes. Like, you know, our friend, you know, well, I won't get into just one example because it's just one example. But I, I think what I love with the multi-sport piece is, okay, let's break it down and, and look at multi-activity. And we don't yes. want our kids just going zero to 100. Mm -hmm. From the couch to in the car for three hours, play a game in the car for three hours, back to the couch. Mm -hmm. we, we don't want zero to 100. We want movement in a variety of ways. Physical literacy is competence and confidence to be physically active in a wide variety of environments to benefit self, others, and your community. So if, say, if, say that one more time. Say that one more time. So physical literacy is the competence and confidence to be physically active in a wide variety of environments. So land, snow, ice, and water is what's meant there to benefit oneself, others, and the community. So like when you're looking at, okay, can my, like, can my kid swim? Can my kid skate? Can my kid run, hop, jump, throw? You know, there's your movement alphabet. But if your kid is just a little baseball player who's just playing baseball, that's where burnout injury, you know, cause it's zero mm -hmm. to 100 to baseball. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're doing baseball in lacrosse, cause now you're quote unquote multi-sport, mm -hmm. but now you're just, instead of doing, you know, 15 hours of baseball, you're doing you know, 25 hours of baseball and lacrosse, but it's still not time to ride a bike. Mm -hmm. It's still not time to, to do a summer swim. It's still, mm -hmm. you know, and it's expensive. So it's almost shaming those who are like in an economic, I mean, we are in the worst economic crises right now since the great depression. And the only reason maybe it's not as bad as then is it hasn't been enduring as long. So while many families are comfortable, many, many, many mm -hmm. more American families are not. And so this shaming to parents of like, if they only can afford one sport for their child, I just don't like the messaging in it. I think this multi-activity um, recreation, like pursuit, free play, playground, mm -hmm. hiking, cross-country skiing, like whatever that might look like mm -hmm. should be part of this conversation a lot more. And again, Twitter's tough, right? Like you only have so many characters. And so I'm not saying people who tweet Oh, multi-sport is the answer. Wouldn't agree with this. They, yes, they probably would. Yeah, but terminology is important. If we say if we over and over, it's multi-sport, 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 multi-sport. At some point, we do have to change that language to no, it's multi-activity. Because for the single mom or single dad out there that's working two jobs, that can only afford to let their child play flag football and yeah. not baseball and you know yeah. basketball and all these. Other, you are not failing as a parent you are just creating opportunities that you can and your child is not going to be behind necessarily and so I, I was I was thinking when you were talking about land ice water and things like that it's crazy because we we idolize the high school athlete I mean the social capital we place on sport is actually unhealthy I mean I, yeah. it, it can be very unhealthy but the the cool kid in the mid-20s is the kid you go to the lake with and he can like do a backflip on the wakeboard and he, you take him snow skiing and he like zips down and like, he's yeah. just good at spike ball and like, they're just yeah. good at all sports. And so no, I know I, my nephew on my husband's side, he, he was a three sport club athlete in college. And I thought that was one of the coolest things, you know, he was on the ski team, he's on the club soccer team and he was doing ultimate Frisbee and, um, he's 26 now and in, in Manhattan and the sweetest young man I've ever known. And I was just like, that is epic. You know, you're a three sport club athlete. <laughs> like, like that's yeah, epic. It know? is. It's so cool, but it's the parents at the younger age. I mean, I'm coaching first grade soccer, little league, you know, church league soccer. And instead of, Oh, so-and-so what a nice little girl they're saying, oh, so-and-so, she's really good, or so-and-so, she doesn't try very hard. I'm like, they're in grade one. Yes. What is, like, what's wrong with you? Like, why, they don't talk about their reading levels mm -hmm. or their, like, math proficiency. 
but if your kid in, in West County, St. Louis, isn't like really proficient in soccer in kindergarten, they're probably not going to be a good athlete. You, you really have to watch it. <laughs> mm, yeah. It's crazy. It yeah, we, Jimmy just sits back and like shakes his head, stands far away. Cause we're like, holy lifting. It's yeah. wild. Yeah. We're not evaluating. Are they polite? Do they know how to interact? Are they respectful? <laughs> Which at the end of the day, folks, if you're out there listening at some point when the cream rises to the top, those are the differentiating factors that will move your kid from average to elite. I truly, truly believe that. But we, we get caught up in this like idea and this movement. And you and I talked about it the other day. Sometimes if you don't go for it, you won't make it. But here's what I would say is that what are, how do we define make it? Mm -hmm. And if, if the, the window of athletics where it kind of even remotely matters, like yeah. it's, it's probably, I would say like maybe like 14 to 22, 23, like yeah. high school, college age. Yeah. That's still like one eighth of your life. Yeah. So the other you I know. Know, portion of your life, that's where you want to have fun. You want to have fun in marriage and parenting and yeah. playing. So, yeah, I know Jim always says he always feels so badly for people that when like high school and college was the pinnacle. Mm -hmm. And I love how he words that, you know, as we're, you know, lugging the tent for our week long vacation. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> yeah. As we bite the hook. <laughs> What's your definition here, Jimmy? You know, but it is, it is so, it's so true. And I just think if we can support families and, and, you know, we invite when we're going to meet on the mountain bike trail, I mean, we'll let other families know, Hey, we will be leaving the trailhead at this time. If you need anything, you know, mm -hmm. Jim will fix everyone's bike for them. You know, like we try to encourage, you know, I, I do believe if, if, to be truly like evolving on your physical literacy journey, thinking about that sense of community, but then now your kids are realizing they're getting the skills and the confidence. So when they're in college, whether they're playing a sport or not, and they're like, if they're lucky enough to be in Charlottesville, they can go mountain biking, yes. right? So instead of just lying around and maybe being hung over or whatever, they can join the, the, the off-road triathlon club mm -hmm. because they have that movement vocabulary mm -hmm. instilled in them and so maybe they're not good enough to make it to a college sport who cares you know if they are able to be act like I always say my best memories never come from like eating Doritos on the couch you know surfing mm -hmm. Facebook like yes. it's typically yeah. from being in nature yeah. you know and and being active with those I love mm -hmm. so I think we need to pause a little bit there and and try to find ways to afford multi-activity to our children and support the community to do so in affordable ways. And here's the good news. Like where, where I live here, there's so much fun stuff that's absolutely free. And I think sometimes families, we just, we, we just neglect it. And so if you're out there listening, here's the challenge. Listen, we are not saying that multi-sport is bad. We're simply not saying it's the only answer. We would probably prefer the term multi-activity which means this, look for some fun stuff to do that's cost affordable and go do it. Pack a sandwich, take a walk, see something you haven't seen, probably right there within 30 miles of where you live. And I promise you, your kids will never forget it. Uh, even as a college coach, yeah, yeah, I made my kids go camping every year. They, I had kids that hated it, but you know what's crazy? They still talk about it today. Yeah, I love that. And you know, I would strongly recommend to looking into seeing if there is a summer swim program. I, I, I love that summer swim. I love I, it. I know. And I think it's because it's 1970s model still, mm -hmm. you know, you, the parents have to volunteer for five meets. The meets are on Monday night. You, you bring your own food. Like, it's not like you have to serve cupcakes. Like I moved to America. And I was like, what do you mean? It's someone's birthday. I'm supposed to bring cupcakes to the whole class. I got oh my I got a call to like Mrs. Stanek. Do you have the cupcakes where I'm like, why it's her birthday? <laughs> like, why would yeah. I Okay. Well, they usually, I'm like, but then she eats cake again tonight. No wonder they feel entitled. Like this is insanity. That is I, it. This is insanity. And, and when am I supposed to get my work done? And when am I supposed to get my run in? If I have to bake now cupcakes and a cake, like it just seems I, I'm, I'm being a little, you know, No, you're not. I love it. Feed, but, feed this, feed me. But it is a little crazy. But the thing with the swim that I love and that I've told you before is that you have the kids who swim you around who just dominate. 
So the kids who are doing other sports, they all realize, okay, so maybe I'm not that like awesome, which is healthy. Mm -hmm. The other thing is you can, you can be last, but win in swimming and cross country events because you're tied. So mm-hmm. you can put in the work and see at the end of the season, holy smokes, maybe I never made it to the top three heats, mm-hmm. but geez, Luis, like, look at what I improved with being consistent and mm-hmm. getting up. It gets the kids up. It gets their brains going. We, our brain have to de- have our brains developed, evolved. They evolved, not developed. They evolved be- to them um, while moving like 12 miles a day. So if we're not providing opportunities for the kids to move, you know, and I even know like it, it, summer swim is cheap. Like it's like a hundred, like in there's often they can waive the fee for yeah. families. Like these are all things. That's why I recommend it. Cause six weeks of getting them up and moving, getting in a habit, you know, I think it's going to prepare them as teens to get up and get out and have a job. You know? And so for all you parents out there, think outside the box, you know, yeah. it's not just baseball, football, basketball, And all those different things. So last week you mentioned this black box and our listeners are probably going, where where are they going with this? It's getting weird, you know, (laughs) and and what this black box can tell us about the sport journey uh, for kids share with our listeners, just kind of open that, open that door for us there. Yeah. So the black box of puberty related to youth sport is it's a summary of a lot of the research conducted by Dr. Colin Higgs who was a professor at Memorial University in Newfoundland. And Colin's uh, presentation that I saw probably 15 years ago, I mean, I'll never forget it as long as I live. And um, it it shows how, if you visualize, you know, if your listeners visualize this black box, and that is the stage of life of puberty. And prior to that, you have early developers and late developers of sport. So you have that kid in kindergarten who is scoring, you know, a hundred goals a game, or you have the wrestler who's winning every tournament at age seven and traveling the country. You know, that's an early developer pre black box of puberty. Mm -hmm. And then you have your late developers. um, And those are the kids who, you know, maybe they're kind of daydreaming a little bit at first, but as they're like, you know, dipping their toes and trying on different genes in sport, Um, Maybe they're plugging away and make a team, but they're definitely not the strongest player by any stretch of the means, right? And so, so then you have this black box of purity. You really, there, there are, and what happens there is the ones who've had to kind of grind it out, like who weren't the superstars, they've had to learn how to like deal with that psychosocial stuff, right? They have to be able to find the joy in it because it's not in the reward of goals, So they're finding the joy of friendship or they're in the journey, if you will. And on the, you know, and yet a lot of the early developers through that stage of puberty, they're not maybe growing as fast. Other people are catching up to them um, in skills. The gap narrows greatly between them and the late developers who didn't, you know, who stuck with it. So what happens is you have a lot of the early developers quitting. So that's when people are calling it burnout. They're calling it all kinds of things, but a lot of it is they have been so identified as being this, oh, that they can't, like psychologically, it's not fun for them anymore. The the joy's gone and the parents like, oh, they're burnt out or they're whatever. Well, a lot of it is there's just so much stake pre-puberty, like so much put on that. Um, And so what happens is at the other end, what we have are a lot of late developers who maybe don't have all that. We've lost people, a lot of the people with the natural ability. And so I would argue that the United States right now is far from doing what they could in terms of owning podiums, in terms of international sporting competitions, because first of all, the cost gets pay to play um, with the decrease in school sport because, because of education funding cuts nationwide. And then also because of this you know, phenomena of people like quitting during this um, at the other end of, of puberty because they can't, they're, they weren't an early developer. So it's just kind of fascinating to think about. No, it, it's, I call it like the, the success and struggle like intersection. Mm-hmm. And so you have some kids that like, they never struggle early. So that when it intersects, they don't know how to deal with it. But then you have this other set of kids in America, and I, I agree with you. I don't think we see 
I think we miss some. Like mm -hmm. we, we see a lot of phenomenal athletes. I mean, I, I've watched oh, yeah. elite level. Like there's some, there's some dudes out there. I'm going, I are lady. I'm like, I've been passed by pl plenty of girls in Ironman and things like that. So I've seen some tremendous athletes, you know what I mean? But I do think we are missing some of ours because one of two things happen. You get those early developers that hit that place of struggle and it, they just don't know how to press on. But then you also have some late bloomers that get pushed out of sport because there's not a coach mature enough to say, Hey, Amanda, mm -hmm. you're not there yet, but I believe you could get there. Mm -hmm. And so we're early identifying or we're identifying at such early ages that like Heath Esslinger may say, well, I'll never be good at wrestling. Now I even tell people, I don't know that I would have made it in the wrestling world because I entered late just because I grew up on a farm in McDonald, Tennessee. And yeah, we didn't know about club sports, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I, I don't know that I would have made it because nowadays, if you're not kicking tail in the sixth and seventh grade, you're, it's, it's like you, you could never be good. I know. And it's unfortunate. I know. And that's why in our conversation, like I, I was sharing a little about my, my nephews who are first and foremost, wonderful kids. And um, they're, these are my nephews back in Canada and they're great students. You know, they do very mm. well in school. And, um, my brothers did a great job and they, with these boys. And so they, they play a lot of hockey and they always have, and they've done it year round. And, and I think about them when I see the tweets about like multi-sports, the only way, because they can ride, they can ride bikes, you know, they can mm -hmm. swim in the ocean. Like mm -hmm. they, they, they spend a ton of time hiking with family set and their buddies. And so while they weren't multi-sport athletes per se, um they're playing in the you know quebec major junior hockey league which is a very high league academy you know mm -hmm. it's like so it's um it is important that i think those of us in the sport world who have a platform really think about the, how the the hot takes that might get the likes and the and the retweets like i know by definition generalization means there are exceptions but i think we overgeneralize way too much and we don't talk enough about the financial piece and access to you know we are very fortunate that yes we have access to trails and all of these things but a lot of kids in this country don't mm -hmm. and so we just need to be very mindful i think of how we we talk about that but in terms of late developers being missed, oh gosh, yeah, I know. Jim Jim jokes all the time that like he wouldn't even be carrying like the 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 kids that play where he wrestled in college or that wrestled there. He's like, I wouldn't even be carrying their their bags. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Luckily, he was a good student, so I don't know yeah. that he needed a slot. But yeah, um, you know, because they're so good, so young and exposed. It, it is just crazy. And so for, for all the parents out there and coaches, leaders, whatever, here, I think our message is there has to be balance. Like I think in, in so many situations in our lives today, because we have so much information, there's so many extremes. It's extreme one way. I love what Tim Elmore says. He says abandonment is really bad. You don't want to abandon your kids. You don't want to abandon their athletic journey, their yeah. academic journey, whatever. Abundance, always having cupcakes, can be equally as bad. And so as, as a parent or a leader, we're constantly, I always picture this scale is that I'm always just trying to balance the scale to keep, to create some sort of equilibrium for the kids mm -hmm. so that when they get to a place where they decide, Hey, I want to go for it. Yeah. I have given them the foundation to go for it. And I think, yeah. I think that we, we both are on, on, on the same page there. So let me, let me ask you this. Let, let's jump in just, just briefly here. Coaches and parents, if you could give coaches, those out there that are directly speaking in to other people's children, these, these mm -hmm. little humans that actually are going to lead our world one day, if you could give coaches one piece of advice, what would it be? I, I, that's so hard, one piece of advice. I, I think it has to be around the relationships. You know, I, when I was teaching middle school, it was always a goal to say two things to each student, each class, so one, good. one related to them as a person. And then one related to their skill. So be, good, you know, be very skill specific. So the research does share that 
uh, when that the variance in skill between boys and girls, it becomes greater prior to it being able to be accounted by growth and maturation. So what's happening is PE teachers were saying to little girls, great job, great try, I, you know, good hustle, like good work. Yeah. And saying to little boys, follow through a little harder. Yeah. Use a little more force in your release. Like yeah. make sure you turn your hips and, and finish. So even though it was out of love and it was really well intended, the positive encouragement to the little girls, it was like doing them a total disservice in terms of their, their skill development, not to be receiving the same skill specific feedback. Mm -hmm. So that's why I say two pieces. Like, so it's one related to relate their, the relationship, like how, how school for you, mm -hmm. what are you learning? Of, even better. What are you learning about math today? Mm -hmm. Very specific question. Mm -hmm. um, or, Hey, is your, is your social studies teacher cool? Like mm -hmm. what are you learning about in social studies? Mm -hmm. Like find out you're, it, it's going to be the best part of your day hearing what they say. Mm -hmm. And if it's, if it's college, I mean, Hey, how's organic chemistry going? Mm -hmm. I hated that course. Like, do mm -hmm. you like it? You know? Yeah. Um, and then, and then again, very specific to the, to the sport. Mm -hmm. So like, okay, I need you to follow through more when you, mm -hmm. you know, after you take that mm -hmm. corner kick, like you have yeah. got to land on that front foot. So those kinds of, that's, that, that's one piece. Let every kid be seen. Mm -hmm. The worst thing a kid can feel is invisible. Oh, it's so. And the ones who need to be seen are the ones we can really miss. Like mm -hmm. they're the third that like really need us the most that we can yes. in sport and physical activity. So mm -hmm. like that relationship could be the reason they're coming. And there's never been a greater compliment or honor that I've ever received um, other than a, a parent telling me, you know, her fourth grade daughter plays soccer and the only sport she'll play because of like coach Stanek, mm -hmm. right? Like there would never be a better compliment yes. to than that ever yeah. um, because she, you know, she felt seen and she felt encouraged. And if she was crying for like no apparent reason, like here, do you, would you like a hug? You know, that's right. It, you know, it doesn't mean this kid's not tough. It just means she is somewhere else on the journey. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean this kid, this kid could grow up and be our president one day it, it, mm -hmm. it, with love and support. In terms of parents, I think I would say allow lessons to be learned through sport with love and guidance. Don't, don't, you know, strip kids of the opportunity to learn and grow, whether it's wonderful or painful, you know, learn with great, like win with grace, lose with grace. Um, if you don't reach that goal, like, what does that mean? You're still loved. Mm -hmm. Do, do you need to readjust? Is this a genetic situation that we just mm -hmm. like, I mean, how many times did Jim and I not achieve our goals because we mm -hmm. just weren't good enough? I mean, mm -hmm. nothing to do with the work we put in. That's okay, right? Like mm -hmm. the sun's gonna rise tomorrow. We're gonna get back up. You're gonna be loved. So I think allow those lessons. Mm -hmm. Don't come and call the coach right away. Role play with your kid to yes. communicate how he or she can talk to the mm -hmm. coach. You, the child wants to email the teacher, the teacher or coach. Okay, let's do this together to make sure a professional positive tone shines through in this correspondence. So I think just don't strip them of those opportunities is what I would tell the parent. Man, one of the things we always say is a lesson can't be learned if it's not allowed. And, mm -hmm. and that's in the good and bad. I mean, the best, you have the best one liners, man. Yeah, yeah. They're so good. You I know, love them. So even in the good things, when we, when we step in and get too involved, we rob them of gaining confidence that, Hey, I can do this myself. And when we step in, in the yeah. difficult things, we rob them of the resiliency that can be learned when they overcome. And so, you know, parent, you know, and again, it's a, it's a, like we call it a misapplication of love is like, we love our kids so much. We're so eager mm -hmm. to help them. And sometimes the greatest thing we can do is not help them. I know. Uh, just let them figure it out. I know, which is why your work is so important, because I think that parents would be so happy to pause and reflect and do more of that if they were tasked by someone like you to do so. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why I'm so pumped with your parent education at A Better Way Athletics, because it is it is truly a missing piece. And if you ask any educator who's gotten out of education in the past five years, they'll tell you it's because the parents. So sad. I know. 
Yeah. I know it is. Yeah. They're not saying it's the money. They're not yeah. saying, it's the, you know, it's the parents and them feeling like they don't have the support to. So that's why I do think it's messed up, but they will take it from the sport side. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I do too. I mean, it's crazy, but that's what we believe. We believe, hey, it's so important to them. They might actually listen. And, the, and, and I know, and they need to understand that like they might want their kid to play in college, but if that kid's not driving the train, good luck. Yeah. And, like, and they may know. think that, but they don't know what all it costs and takes and like I know, how little money's offered. Full, yeah. I think everyone gets a full ride. God, it's crazy. <laughs> so, I know. I so, know. So, so briefly, t- tell me about what you're doing at the JJK Center. You and I have a mutual friend, Mark Mestemacher, who is seriously like he's like an angel on the earth. He's like yes. a saint, like no, no joke. He is. He he's, is. he's probably the one of yes. the best humans I've ever met in my life. But tell no. us a little bit just quickly about the work you're doing at the JJK Center. Well, it all comes back to wrestling, right? Like I married into the sport and it's been so incredible. It's a cult. <laughs> it, well, yeah. yeah. You know, so... I actually met Mr. Mestermarker through Pat McNamara, who um, played the best April Fool's joke of all time. But I am Pat's like biggest fan. So I know he's a mutual friend of ours as well. Um, So I was very fortunate in that um, I took Jackie Joyner Kirsten's story, her autobiography, and turned it into four programs, four uh, that are life skills, like youth development yeah. programs where kids are taught, you know, Jackie's principles, her 15 principles through positive quality physical activity experiences. So there's one for little, little children, you know, K-1 yeah. and then upper elementary high school. And then there's actually even one been developed for college student athletes. And so that was you know, over years, and we created an online training for that. Um, basically, I'm just become a really loyal, like friend and uh, advocate. Very, very humbled to be Jackie Joyner Kirsten's friend. Yeah. She is legit the smartest human that I've ever met, by far. Wow. By far, yeah, she's brilliant. You know, people talk. So people talk about her, obviously her six Olympic medals, which mm-hmm. is kind of a big deal. Yeah, it's a big um, deal. Yeah. Talk about, they talk about her still standing world record and they talk about her smile. And, and I'm just like, yeah, she just only knew how smart this woman is. She's just a freaking brilliant woman. So right now I'm just like a great friend. I help her do some training sometimes. They, it's very exciting. Um, they, under Jackie's leadership as CEO of the Jackie Joyner Kersey Foundation, they hired a director for these programs now, soon to be Dr. Latrice Sales, who's phenomenal. Um, and they just, um, she was able to hire a now, uh, I don't know what the title is, I'm embarrassed, but so there's someone that's going to be supporting Latrice's work as director. Okay. And so the goal is that these programs, which are now going to be disseminated in at least six cities across the country this year, these programs will help generate revenue for the JJK Foundation so they can continue to feed children in the community, provide after school, provide enrichment, sport experiences, summer camps, everything. So um, it's, it's, I'm local to them. Like they're, they're not, I'm not far from, from the center. And so I'm just, a, yeah, I'm not doing specific work for her right now, but um, I'm, I'm her seriously biggest fan in the world i've got a meter i've got oh, a meter. i'm coming to st her? louis i haven't but we're gonna make that happen oh yeah you should if you're but, saying she's the smartest human you've ever met i can't wait to meet her oh she is you asked mr Mestermarker. yeah he is legit she's me they're they're the dynamic duo i call them um yeah so be yeah, absolutely wonderful human and I want more people thank you for asking me specifically about that work because I've done contracts with probably you know, 30 different organizations, but Jackie is, yeah, she's, she's just something special. Well, I know just enough to, about that work because of, of Mr. Messemacher to know just how special it is and how important it is. So grateful yeah. to you for, for Jackie and for all that are involved there. So final question, how can people find you? I mean, what if there's an administrator listening right now and they say, we have got to bring her in to help our teachers, our coaches, whatever, how can they find you? Oh, my email is just amanda at movelivelearn.com 
or you can just go to movelivelearn.com and there's an info tab there. I'm also on Twitter at movelivelearn. Um, so I was real lucky when the night I thought of a name for the for the business, everything was available. That's awesome. It was like two in the morning. I woke up Jimmy and I was like, you're not even going to believe it. You know, so I'm pretty uh, fine. Quick Google and you'll catch me quickly. And my phone number, you know, is on the site and I always pick up. So and like unless I told doing mile repeats. Yeah, unless she's doing mile repeats. She'll she'll answer in between the mile repeats. How much I don't rest do those, much I don't do those very much. I had to get pumped up. I maybe got too pumped up and a little I'm a little pumped up on this call. Yeah. Um, but what what was your rest interval? A 400 meter jog. Okay. Dang. So you were you were going 39s. Wow. You know, wow, I have that's yeah, rolling. It's not bad. I mean, I I'll be 45, so I'm trying to you know, I don't know, you know, with the, that's the thing I need I work from home. And that's the beautiful part of physical literacy journey. You can always like check in and reevaluate and, and then get better. Right. So mm -hmm. uh, a couple months ago, I had a serious talk with myself. It had been a few it. years since I was doing mile repeats and I was like, I need to, so now I'm racing gym. It's good. Good for you. Kick his tail. No, I can't yet. But yeah. what I try to do is have catch him the day after a leg day yeah because he's like you know that's 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 part of my and then i just take a little swat at his quads <laughs> and then take off and then i go <laughs> nice well dr stanick thank you so much for for being on today what a joy and i mean thanks for your influence on me and how you always oh. just challenge and encourage me so uh we'll do this again uh yeah. to to all of our listeners out there, thanks so much for listening to today's podcast brought to you by A Better Way Athletics. We hope you were challenged and encouraged. If you found value in today's episode, please feel free to share it with a friend, give us a rating and review. We would love to hear your feedback. Feedback is the key to growth. So give us your feedback. Send us a question. Also make sure that you hit the subscribe button you, so that you get notified each week when we release a new episode. Until then, keep making a difference and continue to be a part of restoring the joy for sport for everyone involved on the athletic journey.